very much. Um, thanks for um, to the organizers for um, having me, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, being around on Friday night. And um, what I will talk about today is um, um, an overview of various things we we are working um, on, and um, the the unifying uh, topic is that we're using what we call distributional regression forests. So it's essentially random forests, but we don't just want to get point predictions, um, the expected mean, but we want to get the full probability distribution for every single prediction. And um, the, the, the application uh, cases um, I, I will focus on come from uh, weather forecasting, one example being um, precipitation forecasting, so forecasting rain on the next day, and that's also an excellent uh, example for making the point for probabilistic forecasts. Because when I tell you that um, the expectation is on average there will be 20 millimeters of rain tomorrow, that's uh, not, not so exciting. Um, what you really want to know is, will there be rain, yes or no, or with which probability will there be rain? And if there is rain, you might also be interested in is there some light drizzle or will there be a lot of rain? And um, again, it would be interesting to get that in terms of probabilities. And well, of course, you can uh, um, try to um, do binary classification for every one of these thresholds rain, yes or no, and if rain, more than a certain number of millimeters. But um, 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 an approach that does this in one go is the one we're taking. We're predicting the whole probability distribution for the amount of rain, and then we can get the probabilities for all of these things I mentioned from a single distribution. So that's, um, that's the thing we're, we're interested in uh, generally. And so we, um, we established um, uh, this general framework that we call then distributional regression for forests that adapt uh, regression trees and random forests to this uh, probabilistic or distributional um, case. This is joint work with quite a few uh, people, uh, probably most importantly uh, going back uh, the longest time with Thorsten Hotton, uh, with whom I've worked on uh, related uh, methodology for more than 15 years now, and then all the hard work was done by two PhD uh, students, Lisa and Moritz, um, and uh, Georg Meyer and Peter Schnaufer are two collaborators uh, with uh, a background in uh, atmospheric sciences that are collaborators on these uh, weather prediction case studies I will show you. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, when we talk about regression, the starting point uh, of all of this is, of course, the linear model, the generalized linear model, with which I can model the expectation, the mean of some variable I'm interested in, in, in the usual framework. And in R, we can use LM and GLM for that. And if we want uh, to extend these things a little bit, then there's also the by now classic uh, generalized additive uh, model, notably in NGCB or BGAM, among several other packages, of course, uh, where I can fit some, some nonlinear code. And over the last decade, then, there was some uh, interest in generalized additive models for location, scale, and shape, or also called distributional regression, where I model not only a possibly nonlinear mean, but also a possibly nonlinear change in the variance, uh, for example. And the, the package that started this all is GAMLSS, uh, but by now MGCB and BGAM are incorporating it. In GAM Boost LSS, you can estimate the same with boosting technology. And there's a, a relatively recent package called BAMLSS that takes a Bayesian approach to it, which is also uh, co authored by, by a colleague from, from Innsbruck. Hence, I wanted to give it uh, uh, some advertising here. But I will talk about something else. So, this was the, the, the additive modeling approach, the classical parametric and semi-parametric modeling. If we move towards algorithmic modeling, then the classic thing uh, are uh, regression trees, uh, like in our part or in our party, and then later on party kit implementations, among other packages. 
And then you have uh, random forests that uh, uh, extend these hard splits, and you can also smooth uh, things um, by fitting not a single tree, but by fitting several trees and then averaging over them. And uh, the package that pioneered this is Random Forest. By now, you also have the Ranger package, uh, which is a more modern take, and in Party and Party Kit, you also have Random Forests uh, available. So the next step here is then to do what we did in the classical parametric modeling, not just model uh, the mean um, as in linear and additive models, but also do something like this gamma less approach. Model um, the, the, the entire distribution um, with several parameters. And this is what we then call distributional trees and distributional forests. And uh, there's um, a package uh, called this tree, um, still on our forge at the moment, um, uh, and this is based on our party kit implementation. And I will show you how, how this works in just a moment. So the, um, the goal, I think, uh, I already mentioned in the beginning, we want to model the entire probability distribution. We want to leverage uh, the tree and then the random forests um, to, to not stick to pre-specified functions with pre-specified influences because if I fit um, a gamma less s model I need to say which model um, which variable enters my model which variables should interact um, and um, how, how smooth the functions need to be or um, how flexible they may be and so on. And in the tree and in the forest, I don't need to do that in, in the same way. I, um, I can automatically detect uh, steps or abrupt changes, um, and by that can capture nonlinear functions, can capture interactions between variables, um, and so on. And then I can use the forest to smooth these um, effects from the tree and also stabilize and regularize the entire model to, to get more stable results. Um, contrast to a single tree. Oops, that was one slide too many. So the, the starting point is um, uh, nevertheless the tree. And um, uh, to, to show you how the tree works, I use a very, very simple artificial uh, example here. So if we uh, imagine a situation where we have one continuous response y, one continuous regressor x, and the mean jumps up and then jumps down again, and the variance is first small and then large, and then it stays large. So we have only two shifts, um, and um, both mean and variance are uh, affected. And um, mean and variance uh, enter the normal distribution. So this is really very, very simple. Um, if we want to represent this by, uh, by tree, um, then uh, we have this first split. Before that first split, we have a low mean and low variance, or low standard deviation. After the first split, we have another split. Below that, um, we have a high mean and high standard deviation, and then finally, high mean and low standard deviation. And um, if we generate data from this uh, data generating process, and then uh, run uh, this tree of y explained uh, on x on it, then it should recover these splits and it should essentially recover the parameters. And in this case it does because this is really, really very simple. But this is the type of thing we're trying to capture. So not only changes in the mean, but also changes in the variance and they might co-occur or just one of the parameters might change. And we want to have something that is flexible enough to, to detect all of that in a data-driven way without us pre-specifying it. Um, if you um, think about this tree uh, in the way party or party kit usually displayed, it looks like this, jump up and down, low variance, high variance, high variance, or you can also think uh, about it in terms of the fitted distributional model. So in this case, we have fitted three normal distributions with different means and different variants. Okay, so how does this work? How do we, um, uh, how do we learn, how do we induce uh, this, uh, this tree? The starting point is just we have the entire data set. 
at the moment still without any covariates. So we just take the response we're modeling and then uh, we fit some distributional model. So we take some distribution with a set of parameters and uh, then we fit it by, by maximal likelihood. So we can fit normal distribution or any other kind of parametric distribution you're, you're interested in, gamma distribution, uh, beta distribution, um, everything that works in, in this uh, in this framework. And if you look at the gamma SS package, uh, it has uh, um, several dozen of, fa um, uh, of families of distributions. Okay, so the first step is we have one simple fitted model uh, for our entire data set without taking any of our regressor var variables into account. And um, we have the corresponding uh, fit. The question is then, um, do really all of the observations come from the same distribution or not? And um, probably not. Um, uh, and we, uh, we are interested in how we should split up our data to find um, the, the point where the parameters change the, the most. And we do that uh, with um, parametric um, tests for um, association uh, between the model scores, so that's the derivative of the likelihood with respect to the parameters. If you're not familiar with that, think of it as a kind of residual but the residual that uh, takes into account the, the different um, dimensions of your parameters. That's um, uh, in the direction of the mean, in the direction of the variance, or any other parameter you have in your model. And so we take these kind of residuals and uh, take all of our covariates we have available, all of our regressors, and we test, is there an association between these? If yes, well, we take pick the regressor with the highest association and then we, we search for one split point so that our data gets uh, split into two parts. Then we have uh, the response y in the first subsample, the y in the second subsample and then we can simply reiterate the whole thing in the two um, uh, subgroups. So again we fit uh, separate models here and uh, get separate den densities and so on. So the, the nice thing is that uh, I only ever have to fit the model just on the response without any covariates, and the covariates just enter by checking uh, whether there's something there, whether um, the model misfit is associated with one of the regressors, and then you find the best split. And if you then want to fit not only a single tree, but you want to, to find um, a, fit, a forest, you repeat the entire thing on bootstrap samples of sub or sub samples of your data. And uh, in every step of the algorithm, you don't um, supply all of the regressors, but just a random subset to let the method explore um, the, um, the covariate space more efficiently. In terms of um, estimation, this is the last theory methodology, methodological slide. So um, bear with me if that's uh, um, uh, not not your day-to-day -day business. So um, the the way uh, we can think about um, the uh, the parameters we're we're estimating is we start out from the basic um, maximum likelihood estimator without any covariance. And the only thing we change in the estimation is that we introduce some weights in this um, maximum likelihood problem, and the weights depend on our regressors. And in the basic case, without regressors, all weights are fixed to 1. In the tree, the, the weights are either 0 or 1. They are 0 if they are in another um, terminal node of the tree, and they are 1 if the observation is in the same node of the tree. And um, for the forest, uh, we simply smooth these 0, 1 weights uh, over the t-trees. So that for each new observation I want to predict, my, my weights check how similar is this new observation to uh, the observations in my learning sample. 
in a certain sense. And this is what the forest does for me. And then I know with which weight every observation from the learning sample can um, enter this maximum likelihood problem. And this is also known as adaptive local likelihood estimation. Um, and, and that's the basic, uh, basic trick. So um, we, we really fit uh, very simple distributions just with the adaptive weighting depending on our new data. So let's look what we can do with this uh, in, uh, in practice. And um, I told you before, I collaborate um, um, intensively with, with the colleagues from the Atmospheric Sciences uh, Department and we want to do uh, weather forecasting. So, we, uh, we have a problem where we have uh, some inputs X and an output Y we want to predict and we, we have nature as the process um, generating the output uh, from the input. And uh, in an abstract um, thing, way to think about it, the X is the state of the atmosphere now when I'm making the prediction and uh, this would involve temperature, precipitation, wind, air pressure, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, the Y we're predicting is also something of the state uh, of the atmosphere uh, at a point in the future. One hour ahead, one day ahead, one week ahead or something. And typically we want, um, um, uh, with the statistical models we're fitting, we don't want to um, um, predict the entire thing, but we want to have a model for predicting uh, temperature or rain or something. Yeah, so, uh, uh, think about it uh, like this. So, this is data from last March. Uh, we're on one day and we want to then uh, predict what will happen the next day, will it rain or not, and this is uh, the actual uh, observation we had on the next day. And of course, this is not only a problem for statisticians, um, because after all, atmospheric science worked on this uh, for, uh, for decades, and there are many physical results how the transition from here to here actually works. And so this is the first step where no statistics is involved at all. So um, the, um, this is called numerical weather prediction. Um, you, uh, you take measurements of the atmosphere today and then run it through a lot of partial differential equations uh, and try to extrapolate this dynamic system that our atmosphere is. Uh, and the trouble with this is um, the atmosphere is a chaotic system, so little um, changes in the beginning can have uh, massive consequences uh, after a long enough time. Um, so typically, this physical model is not uh, just run once, uh, but several times. So I'll, sh I'll show you um, an example uh, in a moment. And then you have these numerical weather predictions in the end, and this is also what drives the weather forecasts where we're seeing uh, on, on the news. Um, and to, to get more specific predictions at very specific locations, for example, this is Innsbruck Airport, if we want to get um, a prediction adapted specifically for the airport, uh, then we can uh, add a second stage, a statistical model, that's also called model output statistics, so the model this is referring to is the physical model, and we take this uh, NWP output and then we try to refine it, um, match it more closely to the observations we get at Innsbruck. So I, I already mentioned this in the beginning, um, and the, the massive numerical simulations, and the main reason why this model output uh, statistics is, is necessary, that this is a global model, being run for the entire atmosphere of the globe, and um, the, the cells it looks at are 50 by 50 kilometers. There are um, more, um, there are models with the finer resolu resolution as well, but this is what we're using here. In any case, um, whatever the resolution is, if you're in Innsbruck, and you don't need to go 50 kilometers in this direction, or 50 kilometers in that direction, um, to have a completely different weather scenario, because there are a few mountains in the way. So, uh, and also the altitude changes a lot, and so on and so forth. 
So this resolution is too rough for what we want to predict at, uh, at Innsbruck Airport. And um, that's why the, the model output statistics uh, is um, necessary as a post-processing step. And um, yeah, I mentioned already that uh, this system um, tries to approximate something chaotic. Um, and so to capture the somewhat uncertain initial conditions and also unresolved processes in the atmosphere, um, what people do is they run an entire ensemble of simulations. So um, on, uh, on the day I showed you in, um, on the pictures in, in, at Innsbruck Airport, um, we, uh, we can then look at what uh, this uh, forecasting system uh, tells us, um, how does the temperature evolve over the next week and how does the amount of precipitation um, evolve over the next week. So, and we just, just take daily observations from it. So this is just one run of the simulation, and this is then the weather that actually happened um, um, uh, afterwards. <laughs> and you see temperature uh, didn't work uh, so badly here. Um, it was quite a bit colder than uh, initially um, um, forecast. And also we have this misfit here. So for this weekend, there was the expectation that there was a lot of precipitation, um, the expectation there might also be snow again in, in mid-March, and um, um, it didn't happen eventually. But I said this was just one ensemble run, and um, the, initially this was run several times. And we see um, that these simulations did not agree. So in this period where we had this misfit in the temperature, um, there was a, a bigger uncertainty and also here there was quite a bit uh, of uncertainty about how much precipitation we can expect in the next days. Still, we had a lot, a lot less here, but that's because this is just a point forecast. And if we fit now a distributional model, we can also get a probability here for um, that it actually stays dry. And this is why probabilistic forecasts are interesting. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's look at um, the, um, the precipitation forecast. So the, the goal is a daily precipitation amount, um, and we want to do it in a complex terrain like the Alps around it. And um, the, the response that we're trying to predict, uh, we get from the National Hydrographical Service, and we have um, daily 24-hour precipitation sums, and we just took uh, July as an example here, uh, which is the month with the most precipitation in its book, and we have data for 28 years, so daily data over 28 years uh, for an entire month. So that's... Uh, um, 31 times uh, uh, 28 um, 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 observations we, we have. And um, um, we, we do that not only for, for one observation station, but actually for roughly 100 stations all around the world. And uh, the covariates we're using for prediction are these numerical weather predictions we get from this global ensemble forecast system. And um, uh, the regressors we're using are precipitation, obviously. So as part of this NWP, you get a predicted precipitation amount for every day. But um, there are other variables. Temperature, air pressure, convective available potential energy, downward shortwave radiation flux, which is the meteor way to say sunshine. And um, <laughs> these things, uh, then uh, tell you something about uh, how likely it is that it might rain on, on the surface. And we did not just take the model outputs um, uh, as they are, but uh, for, uh, for every time point we have this ensemble uh, of predictions, and we take the corresponding minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation uh, for every one of these variables, um, giving us all in all 80 covariates. And of course, we would expect 
that the precipitation amount is the most relevant variable, but beyond that it's not so clear which of these variables have how much influence and whether there are interactions. If uh, the, the temperature only plays a role if there's a lot of sunshine or just a little sunshine um, and so on. I mean, the, um, uh, if, you, if you talk to the meteorologists, they have of course some ideas. It's not that they're completely in the dark. But they couldn't write down a regression model for you that you could then stick into uh, a GAM or a gamma LSS model where they say, okay, these five variables and those three are interact. And this is not good. So we're here completely agnostic and we just put all the 80 variables uh, in there. And then for our model, we, we, need, we still need a distributional assumption. And uh, we um, use the model that's, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's what people use in practice at the moment with other techniques, with uh, gamma LSS models, for example. So you power transform your rain observations um, to, to take away the, the long tail uh, on the right, um, and then you just fit the Gaussian model sensor to zero, so that there's, you cannot have negative precipitation, and by the, the censoring at zero, you get a point mass, and this gives you a probability for a, a day being dry. And um, to, to get a feeling for what this does, well, we fitted um, um, the model for one station, Axams, which was uh, picked as the station in this particular data set closest to the city of Innsbruck. Um, that, that was the, the whole reason why we chose it. And then we, we learned the random forest on the first 24 years and then predicted the remaining four years. For the prediction, it's important, we, we cannot, it's not that in 2008 we would have been able to predict what happens in 2012. We, we always had to wait for the numerical weather predictions. So um, every day at midnight when we get the model run from this massive numerical simulation, we have our regressor values and then we just put them through our statistical model, which we do not have to refit, we just say predict, and then we get the prediction for the next day. And so this is how it works. So we can just predict it day by day by day, but we don't have to refit our statistical model. This is done just once, and then the entire four years we're using the same model, which is not entire re entirely realistic. You would refit from time to time, but um, this is what we did here. And for illustration, I picked just a single day uh, across the four years we're predicting to show you um, how the model can adapt um, based on the uh, input it gets from the physical model. So we have uh, the four years, and uh, in 2009, for example, it was quite likely to get um, um, quite a bit of rain, um, but it was also quite uncertain, so you had a high variance. Uh, and in 2010, you expected a little bit less rain, also with a relatively high variance, and in 2012, for example, it was quite likely to stay dry, 70, uh, that's, uh, yeah, 70 percent uh, of staying dry, and then you had just a tail of the distribution where uh, some possibility for rain was still there. And then uh, these um, uh, crosses here um, show us what we actually observed on those days. And um, so here, the, the distribution uh, we fitted uh, actually worked quite well. Um, of course, this is just one day, and we didn't have any competition. Um, so uh, you, you could say, well, you can tell me anything. And there was uh, cherry picked, and uh, um, with another method, uh, I could maybe do better. So we do the same thing. Still, just for uh, axioms, uh, do a 10 times 7 fold cross validation, always learning on 24 years, predicting on the other four, and we benchmark that against a few other standard models. So, the, uh, a simple uh, model with linear predictors without any nonlinear effects uh, and using only the uh, total precipitation ensemble, the, the main variable from our um, physical model. Uh, then we uh, also used a pre-specified gamma LSS with variable selection based on expert meteorological knowledge. So we forced them to pick something and uh, 
This is what they came up with, and then we also used the gamma less s and boosted it. And um, so this had all of the variables available, and by boosting we did variable selection. And this was quite quite costly in terms of um, cross validation to get the variable selection, whereas the random forest uh, was quite a bit um, cheaper to fit. Um, and then let's look at the evaluation using um, uh, the CLPS skill score. Um, the reference line here at zero is the standard linear predictor based uh, model called EMOS in the um, weather forecasting literature. And compared to that, we improved by 4% with these gamma LSS models and by 6% uh, with um, our distributional forest. And the only thing, so unlike this model, there was no prior expert knowledge available, uh, needed to, to fit the model, and compared uh, to this, it was a lot cheaper to compute, and uh, essentially for fun, just using the data that is there anyway, we got uh, this, uh, this improvement. And then we used the same thing on uh, all 95 stations um, in Tyrol, and all the green uh, circles are the cases where the random forest did best and did so by um, at least uh, half a percentage point. Um, so that it was not just complete random noise. The white points are where another method was competitive and uh, the, the purple, purplish points um, or triangles or rectangles are the cases where um, another method was uh, was better. So the random forest is not always the best thing, but it's something that very often performs quite well, requires little prior knowledge, and compared to other things, relatively little computation. Okay. Let's, yeah. Sorry, because the question is very, uh, okay, how we kind of, Maybe because the question is very specific to this slide, um, could you identify a reason why specifically for this? Um, okay, so it, it, it might also be just a random. Uh, the, the short story is that so um, here, here we, we, we did not do a full cross validation. So to, to keep things manageable, especially with fitting boosting in the mix, we, we just learned on the first 24 years and evaluated on the last four years. And then it turned out that here in East Row, the, uh, what is it, the pre-specified gamma LSS did particularly well. If we would have used other four years and other 24 years, uh, we wouldn't have gotten this strong signal. So this is sort of spurious from the, the data selection. And if you do a full cross-validation, um, uh, sometimes the relationship is even reversed, or at least the margin is narrowed down between the methods. So, I, I, and, but overall, I think the method, message here is not that the distribution of forest is always better or something like that. It's, the, the point is it's competitive with the other things, uh, but requires relatively little work. You just shove in your variables, you still need to pick a distributional model, but the rest is then being done by the algorithm and by an algorithm that works relatively fast. Other questions about the, the transportation uh, model before I merge, uh, go, go into the next uh, meteorological quantity? Uh, did, you, did you look at uh, variable importance? Uh, yes, we, we did, and um, uh, I, I don't have the, the results here on, on, on the slides, but uh, essentially the variables you would expect also showed up there. So uh, for the meteorologists, this was not anything new. It was not like, ah, oh, we discovered something that is linked to precipitation that we didn't know about before. It's just that we use it a bit more efficiently than, uh, than the other um, models. But uh, you, you, you get always this one odd variable where you think, um, 
total precipitation should be the variable entering, and then you get another precipitation-related variable sucking up the influence in this particular random forest. But you don't know whether for another uh, station or uh, another geographical location things would be different. So uh, um, we, we, we could have pre-selected the variables better than we did. At least I wouldn't have known. Okay, then let's look at wind forecasting. So we, we essentially do a very similar thing, but um, uh, there are uh, two important differences. One thing is we're now doing um, now casting, just one or three hours ahead um, at Innsbruck Airport, because um, in, in this um, uh, uh, fund the project, the Austro Control Group is the cooperation partner, and so they're interested in getting wind speed and wind direction forecasts for optimally uh, managing um, the, uh, the incoming flights, uh, also the outgoing ones, but the, the incoming ones uh, are, um, the wind is even more important. And um, so we, we have a very short time scale. And wind direction is a circular response, um, so we, we need to switch to, to other um, distributional models for that. Uh, also, we would um, uh, expect abrupt changes due to the geographical uh, position. So if we, we look uh, at the position of Innsbruck Airport, we have the North Kette um, here uh, in the north going up to around about 2,500 meters. And uh, Innsbruck is at something like 500 or 600 meters, and uh, also some mountain ridges down here. And uh, this means that we do not get smooth transitions in the wind. So the wind uh, can change the direction from coming from the west to coming from the east uh, pretty abruptly, because there's not much else it can do, essentially. We, we can get a little bit from, uh, from the south, but mostly it's from, from east to west. So um, uh, here a tree makes uh, a lot of sense, more sense than a smooth gamma LSS type model. Um, and uh, the final challenge here is because we're on this short time scale, these uh, numerical weather predictions are really out of the loop here. We're just using observation data that is available at the stations around the end. So, here we're, we're taking a data set where we um, took um, hourly or three hourly observations um, and we have a little bit more than 40,000 um, data points coming from uh, either Innsbruck Airport, which has already several uh, meteorological stations around uh, the runways, and then also six nearby stations to capture what is coming down the valley from the west or coming down the valley from, from the east. And again, we used um, some base variables, wind direction, wind speed, wind dust speed, temperature, air pressure, humidity, and so means, minima, maxima, uh, maxima, looked at temporal changes over the last hour or over the last three hours, and also at spatial differences. If there's, um, so air pressure differences, um, up belly or down belly are particularly important. And um, the distributional assumption uh, we're making is we're using the Formesis distribution, which is also labeled the circular normal distribution, uh, living on um, the, the, the range for, uh, for the circle. And uh, it has a location parameter and a concentration parameter related to the variance. And I can either present it in a linear way here, but of course zero and 2 pi are just the same thing, so I should really wrap it around the circle. And uh, then I see here the mean and uh, the, the density in red, and the gray bars are circular histogram. Okay, just for completeness, the log likelihood is given here, and we can just estimate this model with maximum likelihood as before. And if we do that, um, we get the following tree. We cut the tree uh, at this depth. So it would, uh, with this 40,000 observations, it would become deeper. But to, to give you um, a feeling for what it does, um, I'm quickly taking you through this. 
So the first thing is um, that the current wind direction is the most important predictor. So if it's uh, coming down one or the other way down the valley, uh, we get um, uh, to a different branch of this tree. And you see uh, here we have mostly eastern winds and on this side we have mostly western winds. So this, the current wind direction is the most important um, uh, predictor variable. And then we have here um, um, a difference in air pressure, um, which would uh, tell us if this is very high, and also the current wind speed is very high, then we're very certain that the wind will stay in western direction, so the concentration is really high, whereas if the pressure is lower, and also the wind direction is maybe not that sharply focused, we get a lot more uh, variation. And similarly on the other side. Okay, and then again, this was just uh, one, one example. Let's look at a benchmark. Uh, we benchmarked against climatology. Um, that means uh, we just look at um, over the last, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 years or so what we had uh, on a given day at a certain mm -hmm. time. What's the um, typical wind direction you have at Innsbruck Airport? Um, then we use persistency, which means in the next hour nothing changes. I expect it should be like it is now. Um, and then we used uh, a circular GLM based on the current wind speed and the current wind vectors. The two, um, we split up wind direction into a vector of two, two which is often done in, in practice in these. And if we do that, we evaluate again uh, with a CRPS skill score. This is for the one hourly predictions. Um, and we see, uh, we have climatology as the reference. And we see that the persistency uh, already does a bit better. Does also better than a linear model. But the tree and also the forest gain on this. And we, we have here, um, it's about 20% improvement in, uh, in the CRPS. So th there's a substantial improvement again. And uh, if we do the same thing for three hourly predictions, then uh, the persistency suddenly uh, drops. It's worse than the climatology now, but the tree is just better than the climatology and the forest still uh, quite a bit better. And this is something that's exactly relevant for our project partner. So they, for, for strategic planning, how they bring in the flights, uh, they need this time horizon one hour ahead up to three hours ahead. This is where they can use this. Okay, I think I've, I've used up a, a lot of time uh, already, just very brief mentioning of uh, this class of distributional forests that we call transformation trees and transformation forests, where we use, when we have no obvious classic distribution that we want to fit, we can also use a flexible uh, semi-parametric way to, um, um, to fit models. And I'm not going through the details uh, of this. I'm just showing you one, one example here. Um, uh, it's a model for body mass index distribution in, in Switzerland. And again, I'm skipping the details here, but the point is that this, flexible, this distribution we're fitting is flexible enough to capture changes in the mean, changes in the variance, and also changes in the skewness or other properties of the um, of the distribution. So this transformation family of densities is something you can use if you want to be flexible in all these directions, in mean variance. Um, if you want to use this uh, at the moment, it's not completely uh, trivial because uh, one needs uh, the development version of part kit and then the development version of this tree or circ tree that builds on this tree if you want to fit the circular trees. Uh, all of these are available on the Offwatch uh, webpage. And um, yeah, in this tree, we have functions for fitting uh, a distribution without covariates, for fitting a tree, uh, or for fitting a forest. And uh, this is based on uh, the particle functions are a classical C tree and mob functions, if you have heard about them. If not, this is what our package, the tree algorithms, our package provide. And then uh, the circ tree package has these circ tree and circ forest uh, functions that are built on this tree.
If you're interested in, in more of this, there are a couple of, uh, of papers. Um, the, um, the, the more recent things, uh, precipitation forecasting, was just published in the Annals of Light Statistics. We have a proceedings paper uh, from this summer about the wind forecasting. A new archive paper will come out hopefully next month. And uh, the transformation for forests are also are an archive. And these are our previous work on sea tree mob and the party. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Achim. Uh, are there any more questions, please? Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I would have the question if you could talk a little bit about computational performance, especially uh, compared to standard random forest algorithms like Ranger, and if you can talk a little bit about parallelization in um, okay, very good questions. Um, so to, um, to say this, uh, uh, just at the very beginning, compared to Ranger, everything is terribly slow because uh, Ranger is written in optimized C++ code and everything we're doing here is in high level R, or almost everything. Not, uh, some, some, uh, some of the number crunching is done uh, at, at C level, but um, uh, compared to Ranger, we're so slow because we need these uh, all these statistical model fits. Um, and um, I, I didn't mention this um, explicitly, but uh, into this tree and this forest, you can um, you can plug in all of the families that Gerald SS provides. So you have some uh, hundred something uh, distributional families you can fit with this, and not all of these are implemented in a very efficient way. So for the distributions we're fitting, we then uh, um, provided uh, families that are faster or provide dedicated maximum likelihood fitters which can speed things up. And um, parallelization is easy to do. So especially with random forest, this is an embarrassingly parallel problem. You can just distri distribute it on, uh, across your computational nodes using uh, multi-core or snow or um, any of the other standard interfaces uh, provided uh, in, in R. Um, and, um, and then, uh, if, if you do these things, um, it still depends a bit on how many splits you have to search, so how long your data is, and um, uh, to speed things up, we also have an option to say, well, I'm not evaluating every single possible split, um, especially in the forest, this is typically not necessary. And I say, okay, in every variable, uh, if I search in that variable, at most I'm using a thousand splits or something. So this will speed things up in a way that it is usable, but still not in the same league as Ranger. Any more? So a bit naive um, approach would be to simply do a normal R part and then um, use the empirical distribution of the uh, leaves to, to get distributions. So what I think uh, I understood is that your, the splits of the tree are found in a different way, not by RSE but by some kind of uh, distributional metric. And maybe you could uh, elaborate a bit on the choice for those metrics. Yes, ex excellent question. So um, uh, you, you can do that, and um, if um, what you're what you're searching for is um, the the distributional changes are accompanied by changes in the mean, you have a pretty decent chance to to get a well working um, a model with using R part or random forest. Um, because um, if if every distributional change um, over a certain variable is accompanied by something in the mean, then our part will pick up um, that. Maybe not with the same power we're picking it up, but uh, with enough data, you you can get quite close. Uh, the problem is if um, if you for for example have a change in the variance without a big change in the mean, 
then our part in the random forest will completely miss entirely. Um, and um, uh, this is where where our method comes in. So we're using this um, derivative of the log likelihood with respect to the parameters. This essentially captures um, how stable each of the parameters is across the variable. So it's like it, um, for, for mean and variance, I could use essentially the residuals and the squared residuals. And in the squared residuals, uh, I could pick up changes in the mean and the usual residuals, uh, sorry, the usual residuals changes in the mean and the squared residuals changes in the variance. So this is just a generalization of that so that I can pick up changes in any parameter. But my model, with my model, I, um, uh, I tell the tree where to search, what, what kind of deviations um, I'm looking for. And uh, th this is the, uh, the basic clue. So the scores are just the, the gradients of the likelihood function. And um, um, so these, these tests um, um, essentially assess whether all of these are just random fluctuations, as you would expect in the residuals in the linear model. If the model fits well, you should just have random noise in the residuals, or whether there's a systematic effect, a trend in, in one of them. So that's the, the basic idea. Regarding your brain forecasts, basically, I mean, I'm not a statistician, so I'm not really good at this thing, but aren't you like trying to predict a zero one event? And does this pose a problem on, on the modeling part of this whole thing? It will rain, it will not rain, basically. Well, and you're doing a lot with continuous um, stuff there, so that's, that's why I'm curious, you know, if, if, if the time frame becomes long enough, basically it should always rain someday. <laughs> uh, this is daily precipitation amounts we're modeling. Of course, as oh, so a first step... You're modeling the amount, not just the event. Okay, okay so, so, we, so, so I thought you just, just modeling no, no. the event, so you no. also... Okay. No, we, 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 we model the, uh, the amount. So you, uh, at the measurement stations, you, you have these small cylinders and rain will fall into it and you just measure how much rain was there on a given day. This is our response we're modeling. And this can be zero. And actually, we then have the point mass at zero where it didn't rain at all. And um, then we have, uh, so that's the, the discrete part of the distribution, the sensor part. And then we have a continuous part in the distribution um, where the amount can just go up very high. You know? the, the, um, if you have a, a lot of rain on a given day, uh, this, this can get uh, substantially large. So we, we have this discrete continuous distribution and we're, we're modeling that with a zero sensed uh, Gaussian assumption. So we're fitting um, a model, if you take the green line, uh, that is essentially uh, a Gaussian distribution, where we say, well, at zero, we cannot get lower than that, and the entire probability mass that would be here on the left-hand side is now in a single point at zero. So we can predict everything in one go. We can predict the probability that it stays dry, that it rains, or we can also put thresholds in here. We can predict the probability for getting more than a certain amount.